Ever most vigilant was Mithrandir, and he it was that most doubted the darkness in Mirkwood. For though many deemed it was wrought by the Ringwraiths, he feared that it was indeed the first shadow of Sauron returning. And he went to Dol Guldor, and the sorcerer fled from him. And there was a watchful peace for a long while. But at length the shadow returned, and its power increased. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Happy New Year, my friends. Make 2022 a year of goodness and friendship. Today we will start off the year by continuing our timeline of Arda series, exploring the time of the Watchful Peace and the Finding of the Ring, up to right before the beginning of the events of The Hobbit. Please check out the related articles and videos in the description and cards for more information, and the past videos in our timeline of Arda series to catch up to this point. Much of this information today may be found in the Tale of Years in the Appendices of The Lord of the Rings. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. We begin back where we left off, after the disappearance of Aarnir, the final king of Gondor before Aragorn II. In 2060 of the Third Age, the power of Sauron and Dol Guldor began to grow once more, and Gandalf would take notice of this, coming three years later into Dol Guldor and ousting Sauron, for the Dark Lord was not yet ready to reveal himself. His Nazgul would also stay dormant in Minas Morgul for many years, beginning that which was named the Watchful Peace, a centuries-long break in the conflict with Sauron. However, we must remember the many smaller victories he had already had, especially with the end of Arnor and the end of the Kings of Gondor. Sauron was hiding, biding his time, while his servants weakened his enemies and men. But Gandalf was diligent, and this time aided Middle-earth and its free peoples. Durin's folk, who were still recovering from the fall of Khazad-dûm, followed Thorin I, who in 2210 left Erebor and went north to the Grey Mountains, and for a time the dwarves would dwell there as well. In 2340, the hobbits of the Shire settled Buckland, expanding their civilization as well. But the Watchful Peace only lasted for so long, and fate seemed to bring together many things all around at the same time. In 2460, 400 years after it began, the Watchful Peace ended, and Sauron returned to Dol Guldor with increased strength. Three years later, Saruman, who had also recently returned from the east, roughly around the same time as Sauron did, would be the leader of a new organization of elves and wizards to oppose Sauron called the White Council. Indeed, that same year, in 2463, the Stuur named Deagle would find the One Ring in the Gladden Fields and Vales of Anduin, only to be murdered by Smeagol, who took the ring for himself. He would of course become Gollum, and he would take the One Ring into the Misty Mountains, away from the lands where both the servants of Saruman and those of Sauron would eventually search for it. In 2475, Urukai out of Mordor would once more besiege Gondor at Osgiliath, renewing the war on Gondor. And later that century and early into the next, the orcs began to make secret strongholds in the Misty Mountains, as well as further populate Moria, depicting that all the forces of evil were growing to oppose the free peoples all at once. Indeed, Celebrian, the wife of Elrond, would fall victim to such orcs of the Misty Mountains, and though she would survive, she would leave for Valinor. The same year she left, Orcs and Easterlings called Balkoth overran Kalanarthon during their attacks on the northern marches of Gondor, and Kirion the Steward would only have victory for his people thanks to the Eothade of Rovanion, ancient friends from even before the days of King Eldikar, who shared kinship with them. The Eothade and Gondorians had victory during the Battle of the Field of Celebrant in 2510, and as a result, the Eothade would be given the land of Kalanarthon to dwell in by their friends in Gondor, and so Eorl the Young founded the Kingdom of Rohan. Though Eorl himself would fall years later in further battle with the Easterlings, Rohan would be one of the mightiest kingdoms of men in the later days of the world. Brego, son of Eorl, would complete the Golden Hall of Meduseld, and the capital would be moved from Aldberg to Edoras in 2569. The Rohirrim would prosper and grow for a time, even while in the far north, the dwarves of the Grey Mountains began to struggle with dragons who reappeared, starting the War of the Dwarves and Dragons, ending with King Dane I being slain by a dragon, and the dwarves returning to Erebor and the Iron Hills in the south. But even in this darkness, I should mention that around 2670 of the Third Age, a hobbit named Tobald first planted pipeweed in the Shire, which would change the course of Middle-earth's history forever. Alright, not really, but Gandalf would come to be very happy about this, and our heroes would not have gotten far without Gandalf. 
So it was important to keep the wizard happy. <laughs> anyway, speaking of hobbits, the line of thanes would continue, and the great smeals of Tuckborough would be excavated, depicting further expansion of the hobbits. And in Gondor, the White Tower of Ecthelion would be restored, as though the West struggled around this time period, it still stood tall. In 2740, orcs began to invade Eriador, and seven years later, a band of Misty Mountain orcs would even get into the Shire, giving us the second battle that explicitly involved hobbits in recorded Middle-earth history, the first being the Fall of Fornost. During this Battle of Greenfields, Bandabras, the Bull Roarer Took, slew Golfimbal, the king of the goblins of Mount Graham, thus winning the battle and creating the game of golf at the same time. This would be one of the first true tests of the Hobbits, near the end of the Third Age, but certainly not the last. The Shire was not the only place to be invaded, however, for the War of the Rohirrim and Dunlendings would also break out after the death of the Dunlending Freca at the hands of King Helm Hammerhand a few years earlier. This war from 2758 to 2759 also coincided with the Long Winter, while at the same time Easterlings attacked Rohan in the east, and Corsairs attacked the coasts of Gondor all with some similar coordination. However, Gondor and Rohan overcame these conflicts, and though Helm and his sons died, Edoras was recaptured, as were the coasts of Gondor, and a new king, the nephew of Helm, came to the throne of Gondor, while Saruman was given the keys to Orthanc and came to dwell there, loyally at first, but less so over time. During the long winter, Gandalf would aid the hobbits, and would see their true courage, remembering this for the rest of his time in Middle-earth. A short while later, in 2770, Smaug the dragon took Erebor and destroyed the Manish kingdom of Dale, forcing the Longbeards into exile and the men of Dale to move southwards, who would eventually create Lake Town. Soon after this, the orcs of the Misty Mountains and Moria would suffer a defeat in the War of the Dwarves and Orcs, but the Seven Houses of the Dwarves would also take terrible losses. The exile of the Dwarves into Eriador would eventually drive King Thrain to attempt to revisit Erebor, but instead, King Thrain would be captured and imprisoned by Sauron's servants in Dul Guldor, as the last of the Seven Dwarf Rings was taken from him. Gandalf, in 2850, who was still suspicious of the shadow in Dul Guldor, would discover this, and he would find Thrain in Dul Guldor, learning the bitter truth that the necromancer was in fact Sauron. Gandalf would receive the map and key of Erebor, which would greatly aid Thorin's company in the future. The next year, Gandalf would urge an attack on Dol Guldor with the information he had learned, only to be overruled by Saruman, who was truly beginning his transformation to evil, as he was searching near the Gladden Fields for the One Ring, not knowing a creature named Gollum had taken it into the mountains. As the end of the age drew closer, the White Tree of Gondor would die, and no seedling could be found. And some years later, Gondor would be attacked once more by the Haradrim, which were stirred to battle by emissaries of Sauron out of Dol Guldor, and Gondorians and Rohirrim both would fight the Haradrim together during the Battle of the Crossings of Poros in 2885, even as the Rohirrim had been attacked by orcs out of the north earlier that century. In 2901, most inhabitants of Athelion would desert that part of Gondor due to attacks from the Uruks of Mordor, and the secret refuge of rangers Henneth Anun would be built. Ten years later, the fell winter would hit the Shire, and white wolves invaded Eriador and the Shire specifically from the north. From the fell winter, a flood would leave the Numenorean settlement of Tharbad ultimately ruined and deserted. Tarnished was this memory of the Second Age. Indeed, though there were many years here and there of peace for the different inhabitants of Middle-earth during this millennium, especially for the elves, the years had not been overly kind since the end of the Watchful Peace, which speaks more to Sauron's plan at this point in the timeline. If you've watched the timeline up to now, you can see how many different strategies both Sauron and Morgoth had, and how many of them failed, which I speak to more in another video on Sauron's plans, but at this point in the age, Sauron had time and multiplying servants, both of which he used to his advantage. He was trying to wear down his enemies over time while he searched for the ring, as Saruman discovered in 2939, as Sauron's servants also searched the Enduin near Gladden Fields, just like Saruman did. And even if Sauron did not find the One Ring, he still believed that his plan to wear down his enemies and wait over time for any great opponents who might oppose him to fade from the world would be enough to defeat the Free Peoples, but hope was stronger with the West than with the Shadow. 
Aragorn and many other heroes of the age would be born in the 2900s. And indeed, as we shall discuss in the next episode, many great evils of the world, which have been in play since the very beginning of this timeline of Arda series, would be given permanent defeats by such heroes, who worked alongside Gandalf, who, during the events of this episode, was one of the only figures to oppose Sauron in any major way. And so we shall end this episode here, right before the events of The Hobbit. For though the centuries had delivered many hurts to the West, things were about to change for the betterment of Middle-earth forever. Our next episode shall be the last of this nearly five-year-long running series, as we shall discuss the fall of Sauron and the return of the king, as well as the end of the timeline of Arda. And so, we come to the end of our tale today. From this tale of these years in particular, we see that when we are up against evils of any kind, it is best to have great allies and friends at our side, that we might have victory in the end, just as Gondor and Rohan had each other, and the world luckily had Gandalf. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of the Timeline of Arda. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections on this portion of the timeline? Let me know in the comments below. I think these centuries of years provide such interesting stories from so many different factions of Middle-earth, such as the struggles of Gondor and Rohan against orcs, Dunlendings, Easterlings, Haradrim, and Corsairs, or the dwarves against the dragons and orcs, or even the hobbits against the orcs and wolves. They all make for wonderful tales. Thanks to our Valar tier patrons, Adrian De La Torre, Chris Ortner, Kyle Wetzel, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putnam, Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, Merton, John Hume, Jennifer Wood, Sam McBee, Matt Zabach, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Ben Gardner, Condar, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrolik, Kuzan, Brandon Glidden, and Molly Sullivan, our newest Valar tier patron, first of the new year. Thank you all so much, and thanks to all of our patrons. It really means a lot. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next Sunday with a video on the history of Minas Tirith, the Tower of the Guard. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.